Hey guys, Leslie here, and today I want to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is anti-aging and how we can find ways to actually halt that aging. So when I talk to my friends and I say, hey, you know, what do you think anti-aging is? And do you have an anti-aging regimen? They always say, yeah, you know, it's kind of holding back the hands of time. And my anti-aging regimen is exercise, eating sensibly, getting sleep, things like that. And then there are some people who will also come at it from a cosmetic point of view and say, as long as I can hold back the hands of time with the way I look, whether that's my skin or my hair, and that's dyeing my hair or uh, injecting fillers or doing Botox or even a little plastic surgery, that is anti-aging to me. So from my point of view personally, anti-aging is really a whole body systems biology approach. And it comes from this wonderful paper that appeared in Cell in 2013. And it's probably one of the more important papers of the last decade. Um, it's called The Hallmarks of Aging, which you can see very clearly there. And it's got a pretty, um, this paper was cited over 2000 times and it has the diagram of that to show you, which is fantastic, uh, is used in lots of anti-aging research. So the diagram that they've used here are the nine different pathways through which aging occurs according to the authors. And what's really cool about what they say is that they posit that we don't actually die of, say, cancer or Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or autoimmune diseases, but rather that we die because we get old down one of these pathways. And because we get old down one pathway, it's a slippery slope and the other pathways begin to falter as well. And that is what leads to disease. So it's a, it's very different from how we've thought about longevity or death previously, um, where we have been thinking about how do we reverse a specific disease? But their argument is you don't reverse a specific disease. Of course, if you've got the disease, that's good. But the best prevention is actually to make sure that you focus on each of these different pathways and optimize them so that you don't actually falter on any one of them. So I want to just tell you what each of the pathways are, but I want to do it in a way that, um, you know, that everybody can understand. There are lots of videos out there on YouTube that will go into the science. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a patient. And, you know, you want to have a basic idea, but you don't want to be overwhelmed with information. So let's just start with genomic instability. So we all know what the genome is. We, um, we inherit our genes from our parents and a lot of us will have, for fun, run our DNA uh, and you know got our genes sequenced either through 23andMe or maybe some of us have even done something fancier here in the UK, maybe use something like chronomics. And when you look at your genes, you want to make sure that as you get older, you want the genome to stay stable because that's your little blueprint or recipe card that tells your cells how to actually replicate as you get older. And I like to, uh, to compare it to this very old cookbook of mine. Um, which I have probably overloved and left on the counter of my kitchen with too much water or cooking oil or something that I shouldn't have done because, as you'll be able to see, some of these pages are actually and unfortunately stuck together. So what happens when they get stuck together is that you'll see some of the pages actually lose their text. And it's the same with your genes. If over time the genes lose the original recipe, you get genomic instability. Now, to sort of protect your DNA, we have something called telomeres. 
and telomeres are often described, I'll just grab my shoe here, telomeres are often described as the end caps of our DNA. So if our shoelaces are our DNA, then these little plastic end caps are the things that keep our DNA from fraying and keep the integrity of the DNA. And so that would be the second pathway, which is called telomere attrition. Now, telomeres actually have an inbuilt ability to repair themselves using an enzyme called telomerase. However, if the damage is too much, and some of you know you might have used scotch tape to kind of clean up those end caps if your shoelaces have ever frayed before. So you can put a little scotch tape there, but at some point it's simply too much. The damage is too great and you can't repair it. So telomere attrition is one of those things that they say is a big hallmark of aging. The next one is called epigenetic alterations. So I mentioned the genome. But what we're learning now is that your genes are not necessarily fixed. As a matter of fact, uh, we know from the work of Nobel Prize winner Barbara McClintock that corn, the corn genome, when exposed to drought, would actually sort of shuffle its genes and come up with a new set of a new set of genes and a new expression. So that's often they often say that. That's like switching different genes on and off. Now you can do that to uh, a certain extent, but over time, if you do too many of those epigenetic alterations, you actually can increase inflammation, which leads to inflammaging. So it's got that aging word in there, so you know it's aging that's caused by inflammation. The next thing is called loss of proteostasis. That's a really fancy word. It basically means loss of protein balance or protein homeostasis. Right, so what are these proteins? Um, so in your cells, you have uh, mitochondria, you have proteins, you have a lot of other things that are doing specific actions you need for the cells to function properly. And all of our tissues and organs and ligaments are made up of all these cells. Now, the proteins are quite important. And I like to think of them, although, you know, they often say proteins that are misfolded um, are the ones that are troublesome, uh, which you could think of like the towels in your you know, misfolded towels in your, in your airing cupboard. But I like to think of those proteins more as Lego. And if you think about it, um, these proteins are three-dimensional. So I like these particular Lego that I grabbed from, uh, you know, an old bunch of toys from my kids. And the Lego actually are very folded, very particular shapes so that they fit together in a particular way. They lock together with other proteins so that they can actually function as a new whole. And that's how the protein should be. Unfortunately, over time, you can get um, misfolding where those proteins don't lock together well. And that's what is called loss of proteostasis. So those misfolded proteins. Another area is called deregulation of nutrient sensing. So naturally, you know, we've got to take food in, right? And that's what, that's the, the sort of fuel that allows us to do the things we need to do to build new cells, to uh, have the energy to go out and run or, or think, do lots of things like that. So these, there are four big sensing um, well, I'll just say there are four big sensors and they're kind of like the sensors on your car that tell you, um, you know, you can go forward and you're not going to bump into anything or conversely, you can go backwards and not bump into anything. So I'm not going to go into those sensors right now because the vocabulary, I don't want you to get too worried about the vocabulary, but basically those sensors tell us whether it's feast or it's famine and we've got nothing. And you kind of want to go in between these two. You need this, you need some feast if you want to continue to grow. 
uh, if you want to build muscles and things, but all the studies on mice show that if we've got caloric restriction where we don't have much in our little bowl here, that we can actually prolong life. So that is the nutrient sensing pathway. Another pathway is what we what is called mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondrial dysfunction happens when the powerhouses of the cell, the energy powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria somehow fall into disrepair. And I've talked about autophagy before, and it's very key in making sure that our mitochondria are uh, properly disposed of uh, so that they don't start malfunctioning. And, um, you know, that is a very important pathway. Dr. Terry Walls at the University of Iowa, who famously cured herself of her multiple sclerosis, has this saying that you need to mind your mitochondria. And what's interesting about mitochondria is that um, they're actually um, a foreign, kind of a foreign thing to our bodies. Um, they have developed with us and they've got their own DNA. So we have our DNA, but they have their DNA. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong and we do need autophagy to function properly in order to make sure that that pathway functions well. The next pathway is called cellular senescence. And senescence basically means death. And, um, you know, your cells need to, it's kind of like with the tires on your car. You need to know when they're about to wear out. You need to anticipate that before they actually blow and you have an accident. Unfortunately, as we get older, our ability to sense the, uh, the tires getting thin and that it's time for us to replace them, and then even our ability to replace them is impaired. So we can't sense that we need to replace it and that it's getting thin and we can't do the replacing at all. Now, cellular senescence is important. Um, when we're young, it works very well. And as soon as we see a cell that is not functioning properly, the body says, yeah, right, that cell has got to die. And the immune system kicks into action and helps clear that away. But as we get older and our immune system is less adept at doing that, we aren't so good at clearing those cells that really need to be cleared out. And when that happens, we get what are called zombie cells. So zombie cells, you know, imagine these folks here are the healthy cells. The zombie cells here in the back, you know, they can actually all coexist together. However, the zombies are eventually gonna get these guys. And in the meantime, before they get them, these healthy cells are going to be under a lot of stress. So you don't want to have zombie cells. You wanna clear them out um, so you're not stressing the healthy cells and so they don't all become zombies. The eighth pathway is what's called stem cell exhaustion. So we've probably all heard about stem cells, how uh, wonderful they are at repairing things. Some of you may have even heard about um, babies that have been operated on in utero, where say heart surgery was performed while the baby was still in the mother's womb. Baby uh, is born a few weeks or months later and there are no scars. And the reason there are no scars is because the baby has these stem cells and is able to repair and regenerate tissue and there are no scars at all. And that's quite, um, quite tantalizing. So there are a lot of companies that have sprung up to uh, take your own stem cells, whether derived from your bone marrow, from your fat, even from skin cells, and then um, grow them in a lab maybe use a stem cell expansion chemical to uh, grow those colonies and then re-inject them back into you. Um, this is, uh, when you take your own stem cells, that can be quite controversial because there's a sense that maybe some of those cells could be rogue cells and might actually lead to cancer. 
um, which is why you have some companies that are looking at uh, taking them from the placenta, which has a lot of stem cells. You may have also heard about stem cells in your baby's umbilical cord. And there are companies that do actually store uh, cord blood. Um, and the idea is that later in your baby's life, if there is any kind of an accident, you would be able to go to those stem cells, um, expand them, and then inject them into the baby, now probably older, and those stem cells would be able to repair the damage in that child. So when we no longer have those stem cells, and that unfortunately happens as we get older, we are less able to repair that damage. Now, it makes sense that we don't have stem cells forever because when we're young, we need the stem cells to keep us growing, to make sure that our organs are developed and grow to the right size. But obviously, you don't want to keep growing, right? So stem cells do, um, do tail off. And the unfortunate thing is that as we get older, that can be problematic. I will go into stem cells, um, which are a particular interest of mine in another video. So you'll be able to, uh, to learn more about that. Finally, the last pathway that leads to aging is something called altered intercellular communication. And I like to think that when, um, when we're young, we've got this amazing switchboard between all of our cells. And, you know, you've got these really nice uh, young uh, switchboard operators that are really on it, right? They're bringing their A game and they are definitely uh, connecting the right lines to each other. And there's great communication between the cells. Unfortunately, as we age, and I don't know how many of you are going to remember her, but, um, and I'm definitely dating myself here, but some of you re may remember Ernestine, uh, played by Lily Tomlin many years ago. And she was the sort of meddling um, telephone operator with Ma Bell who would just cause mischief and trouble. And that is damaged intercellular communication at work. When things are not actually getting connected to the right place, where somebody is doing some mischief between our cells and things begin to malfunction. So that is, in a nutshell, an introduction to the hallmarks of aging and this amazing chart and this absolutely wonderful paper, which you can access online if you want, just go to Hallmarks of Aging, um, go to PubMed, and you'll be able to download it yourself. But um, that's really the Cliff Notes uh, version of the Hallmarks of Aging. I will go into each one of those nine Hallmarks, and I will talk about the ways that we can actually reverse each and every one. Stay tuned. Thanks again for watching. Any questions at all, leave them in the comments below. Bye.